Hi, and welcome to Roswell United Methodist Church. My name is Michael Cromwell, and I have the joy of serving as one of the associate pastors here at RUMC. Thanks for joining us for our on-demand version of the sermon, which will be delivered later today. If you'd like to watch our services live, you can do so via our live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15. Notice our different worship times and our different hours that we have now. You'll also be able to see the entire worship service service on demand later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. We are so glad that you are with us today. We're thankful for your presence and we're thankful for your generosity and the different ways that you are helping to make RUMC a place of community and faith. Let's have a word of prayer before we hear our sermon. Gracious and loving God, we love you so much and we are grateful for this day and this day that we have to worship you. May the words that we are to hear, may they not only pierce our ears, but pierce our hearts as well, that we might be changed in different people because of what you have to say to us today. We thank you and we love you all in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now let's hear our sermon from today. This morning I'll be reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 1 through 9. And this is what it says. From Paul, God called me to be an apostle of Christ Jesus because that is what God wanted. Also from Sosthenes, our brother in Christ, to the church of God in Corinth. To you who have been made holy in Christ Jesus, you were called to be God's holy people with all people everywhere who pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ their Lord and ours. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I always thank my God for you because of the grace God has given you in Christ Jesus. I thank God because in Christ you have been made rich in every way, in all your speaking, in all your knowledge. Just as our witness about Christ has been guaranteed to you, so you have every gift from God while you wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to come again. Jesus will keep you strong until the end so that there will be no wrong in you on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ comes again. God, who has called you to share everything with His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, is faithful. Pray with me. Lord, You are faithful. May we never, ever forget that. That this day You come to meet us not because of our goodness but because of your goodness, because of your faithfulness. Thank you that you meet us here. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Anyone who knows my father well knows that my father loves a bargain. I don't know about you, I don't know about your dad, but my father loves a bargain. And most often, bargains are found when he buys in bulk. So fairly often people say, hey, I saw your father. And I'll say, Costco? And they say, well, yeah, how did you know? <laughs> well, that goes along with buying in bulk and getting a bargain. And about the only thing better than buying in bulk and getting a bargain is buying in bulk, getting a bargain, and getting a rebate. Oh, that's the trifecta for dad. If he can buy in bulk, get a bargain, and, and a rebate, he's in his happy place. Well, there was a time where he was getting rebate after rebate. After, he was rebate rich. And one of the things that he did was he would share his rebates with his children. It wasn't unusual to go out to the mailbox, open the mailbox, and, and there was this, this surprise letter from Procter & Gamble or from Union Carbide and a check attached. It would be a rebate. The dad had... Had, had gotten and sent it to his children. I remember it, and I remember it well, because at a particular point in my life, the rebates weren't just, oh, wow, that's nice to have. They were much needed. It was great to have. And I remember it was a, a Thursday. At the end of the day, I had gone out to my mailbox, and I saw that there was a, a check. Here it is right here. It was a check that um, Dad bought in bulk. And he got the rebate and he, he sent it to me. And I thought, this is fantastic. I, I can take it to the bank tomorrow. So I put it on the edge of my desk so I wouldn't forget it there at the house. And 
I left early, early in the morning, and I didn't get back until late, late Friday after the banks had closed. Well, I knew I'd missed it, so I thought, I'll get it and I'll put it in my car. And that way on Monday, I can take it to the bank and get it cashed at that point. Well, I put it in the glove compartment and uh, forgot about it. And when I remembered that the check was in there, I pulled it out and I, I read and it said, void after 90 days. That was December 12th, 1980. <laughs> I, I'm pretty sure it's not good anymore. But I held on to it. I held on to it because in this there's a truth. And the truth is, there's a difference between being given a gift and receiving a gift. A difference between being given a gift and, and, and putting that gift into service. Putting that gift into to, to purpose. Putting that gift into practice. I had been given a gift, but it never was put into service. Never was put to purpose. It never was put into practice. There's a truth in that. This morning I read from 1 Corinthians, and Paul wants to make sure that you know, the way he puts it in verse 5 is that you're made rich in every way. Why? Because verse 7 says, you have every gift from God. Every gift. Well, that, that is rich in every way. We have every gift from God. And verse 8 so that Jesus will keep you strong. So that Jesus will keep you strong. That these aren't just words that, yeah, here's some good tips for you. No, this is so Jesus will keep you strong. That you have every gift. And that's what I want to talk about this morning. Gifts that are given. It's a thread that goes from the beginning of 1 Corinthians to the end of 1 Corinthians. And again and again and again, if you follow that thread, it's really more like a cord or a rope, really, that you'll see again and again and again the gifts. The gifts that you and I have been freely given. And we've been made rich. And the first gift that I want to talk about this morning is the gift of God's Spirit. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 12 says, Now we've received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we may know the things freely given to us by God. It's a gift. It's not earned. That's called a wage. It's a gift. It's not deserved. It's a gift. And you've received, not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who's from God. That we might know the things freely given to us by God. That we might have, have, have eyes that are a little different than the eyes we were born with. We'll have eyes, not just to see the, the Spirit of the world, see hardship and heartache, but we'll have eyes that see His Spirit and follow. Tony Campolo tells a story about a pastor friend of his who is trying to get the leaders of his church to listen to God's Spirit. Well, there was one particular deacon that just had a hard time with it. The pastor told him to, to pray and listen to God. Well, all that this deacon could come up with is that, that God was leading him to, to organize a small group to go to the nursing home and lead a, a church service there once a month. He wasn't going to speak in it. He wasn't going to pray at it. He certainly wasn't going to sing in it. But he felt that God was, was nudging him, leading him to, to organize a small group of folks. So that's what he did. He organized a group of folks. They went to the, the nursing home, and he went over and stood in the corner. Well, while the deacon was standing in the corner, an old man in a wheelchair rolled up and grabbed his hand and held his hand during the service that they had there at the end of the service. The old man in the wheelchair let go and, and wheeled away. Well, they had the service once a month, and once a month the same thing was repeated. The old man in the wheelchair would come up and hold the deacon's hand, and at the end he'd, he'd wheel away. So one month the deacon came in and asked the nurse where the old man was. He said, well, she said, well, he's, he's in his last days. 
He's unconscious, but he's in the room down the third door on the right. You can see him if you want to. Well, that wasn't something that the deacon was accustomed to, but he went down there, third door on the right. He opened the door, and sure enough, there was the old man. He was unconscious, and there were wires and tubes, and, and uh, it just wasn't what he was accustomed to at all. He was very uneasy with it, but he felt an urging from God to go there and sit down next to the old man. And he sat down and he, he held his hand. And then he, he felt an urging from the Spirit to, to pray. And he prayed. And then at the end of the prayer, he, he said amen and he squeezed the old man's hand. And the old man squeezed back. Well, the deacon began to cloud up and he... He knew that he probably needed to get out of the room real quick before somebody came in and saw him crying right there next to the man. So he kind of gathered himself, and as he was making his way out of the room, a woman came in, and she said, Oh, I'm so glad you're here. He's been waiting to see you. Well, the deacon said, What? He said, Yes. He kept saying that, he didn't want to die until he held the hand of Jesus one more time. I told him that when he died that he'd have a chance to, to talk to Jesus and hold his hand all the time. He said that's not what he was talking about. That's not what he was talking about at all. He said once a month, Jesus comes and holds his hand. And he didn't want to die before he held the hand of Jesus one more time. Paul tells us, 1 Corinthians 3.16, you're the temple of God and the Spirit of God dwells in you. It's a gift. It's been given. That Jesus makes himself known in and through you. And Paul also tells us in 2 Timothy 1.7 1, that he's given us not a spirit of timidity but of power and love and discipline. And it's a power, it's a power that, that leads, that urges, that gives strength into a world that needs to know what the hand of Jesus is like in the here and now. It's a gift. It's a gift. And... Well, there's a difference between a, a gift that's been given and a gift that, that's received, that's put into practice, that's put to purpose, that's put into service. For God's sake, for God's sake, put it into practice. Put it into practice. It's a gift given. Spirit of God in you, it's a gift that's been given. And the second thing that I want to talk about this morning is the gift of love. It's a gift that's been given. Now, whenever the preacher begins to talk about love, I, most folks go, well, he's hit a home run. There's something about us that just lights up whenever the preacher begins to talk about love, and, and we feel all warm on the inside. I heard somebody say that love is that feeling that you feel when you feel something you've never felt before. And we get this feeling that, or this idea that love is about a feeling. And that's a, a, a wonderful part of love and the natural part of love. This feeling that takes us over. But if, if we think of love only as a feeling, it leads us down the wrong road. It's natural, but it's not, it's not the gift that the Bible talks about. When I was about five years old, my mother was doing the family devotion. My brother and sister and I were sitting on the bed, and she was reading from a, a little children's devotional book. And, uh, and I remember she, she read, Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself. Well, being a five-year-old, I, I took that very literally. Love my neighbor, and I knew who my neighbor was. It was Kelly Frazier. She was two years older than me. She was a foot taller, and she was twice as strong as I was. And then I panicked. 
then I, I had to love Kelly Frazier, so I blurted out, I can't kiss Kelly Frazier. <laughs> Mom said, what? I said, Jesus said, said, love your neighbor, that's Kelly Frazier, and I can't kiss Kelly Frazier. She'll beat the tar out of me. <laughs> and Mom said, calm down, Tom. I said, I can't. Jesus said, love your neighbor, and if I kiss Kelly Frazier, she'll beat me up. Well, finally, she got me calm, and Mom said, it's not talking about kissing Kelly Frazier. When Jesus said, love your neighbor, he's talking about doing what's best for other people, not just what's best for you. Now, Mom never had a New Testament Greek class, but she hit it over the fence with that one because that's exactly the kind of love that Paul talks about here in 1 Corinthians 13, starting in verse 4. This is what he says. He says, love is patient. I'm going to let that linger for just a second. Do you always feel patient? If we think of love as, as a feeling, that's going to lead us down the wrong road. Paul's not talking about a feeling. He's talking about something that's put into service before we feel it. He says, love is patient. Love is kind. Do you always feel kind? Love is not jealous. Love does not brag and is not arrogant. Love does not act unbecomingly. It does not seek its own. Now that's what mom was talking about. It doesn't seek its own. It doesn't seek just what's best for us. It seeks what's best for the other person. It's not provoked. It does not take into account a wrong suffered. In other words, love doesn't make lists. It doesn't say, well, I did this, and, but I did the other thing. Yes, but you, you forgot that I did this. Love doesn't make lists about what it does. Feelings, what well, comes natural makes us want to make lists, but this, that's not what this is talking about. Love doesn't take into account a wrong suffered. It does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth. It bears all things, it believes all things, it hopes all things, and endures all things. Love never fails. Feelings fail. Feelings very often have to do with our last meal and when it was. Feelings often have to do with how well we slept. Feelings come and feelings go, feelings go up and feelings go down. Paul's not talking about a feeling when he talks about love right here. He's talking about a gift. A gift that, that God gives to you and to me. A gift. A gift where, where our will is changed. Where our feelings are changed. Where we're, well, what he says right here, that where Jesus keeps us strong even where naturally we aren't strong at all. And we love. Not just when it's easy, but especially when it's not. Not just when it comes natural, but most especially when it doesn't. A love not based on feelings, but the Spirit of God. It's a gift. It's a gift that's, that's, that's given. But, as I said before, there's a difference between a gift that's, that's given and a gift that's received, that's put into practice, a gift that's put to purpose for God's sake. Put the gift of love into practice, into purpose. It's a gift that's been given, that gift of love. It's a gift that's been given, that gift of His Spirit. And the last thing that I want to talk about the morning, this morning is that a gift that's been given is the gift of the gospel. The very end of 1 Corinthians is chapter 15. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1, it says, Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I also preached to you, which you also received. There's the gift, given and the gift received, in which also you stand. That's the practice. By which you are also saved, 
If you hold fast the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain, for I delivered to you as of first importance. Now he's getting somewhere. He's talking about that, this first importance. Now I, I delivered to you as first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. A first importance, the cross. That's the first great doctrine, and that doctrine is redemption, that on the cross something real, something powerful, that, that the gospel is, is being fulfilled, that he ushered in a new creation, a new kingdom, a new beginning for you and for me, for the whole of the world. He ushered in a new creation through the cross, and he offers forgiveness for all that's past, all that's present, all that will be. And it's redemption. But it doesn't stop there. He also says that, that he was buried and on the third day he, he rose. Yes, the, 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 the cross is, is the first great doctrine, redemption. But the first great fact of the Christian faith is the resurrection fact that Jesus rose from the grave, a fact that Jesus rose to live his life in, in you and me, that it's a gift. It's a gift given that we might have hope. Sunderstrom Air Force Base is uh, one of the coldest Air Force Bases on the planet. Not the coldest, but one of the coldest. It's in Greenland read a story about something that happened there at Sonderstrom Air Force Base that uh, there was an air disaster a little while back. 22 people were killed. And here on this incredibly harsh, cold Air Force Base, it fell to the, the chaplain to gather the bodies and to comfort those who were mourning the loss fell not only to a chaplain, but to a young lieutenant who was appointed as the, as the mortuary officer. They were to gather together some volunteers to help gather the bodies there. It was grueling. They started early in the morning gathering up the 22 bodies, putting them in ba bags, and collecting them there. At the end of the night, each person went to their room. That is, except for the, the young lieutenant. He went back to, the, to the, the room of the chaplain. He knocked on the door, and when the chaplain opened the door, the young lieutenant was in tears. And this is what he said. He said, as we were picking up the bodies today, I realized something. I realized that the only other people out there with us were the people who go to church here. I've always been an unbeliever, and I used to ridicule these same people who were out there with us. Yet they're the only persons who would or perhaps could do what we had to do today. It must have been their Christian spirit that could help them see beyond the horror, to the hope. And that's what the Spirit of the risen Christ does in, in you and me, in Christians who receive His Spirit. They help us, it, that it's His Spirit that helps us see beyond the, the horror to see the hope, that helps us see be, beyond the heartache to see the hope, that helps us see be, beyond the, the hardship to see the risen Christ is giving strength and, and power that, that we don't have on our own. That on the cross, the power of the gospel was, was laid out for you and me. That, that Jesus took all those things that would destroy us and he took away their power. And when he rose from the grave, he gave us that power over all those things that would destroy us. All the hardship, all the heartache, all the horror, 
And that strength, that power is, has been given to you. It's a gift. It's a gift. But as I said, there's a difference between a, a gift that's given and one that's put to use. One that's put to purpose, put to practice. This morning, it may be that you knew the gift that had been given, that Christ gave his life on, on the cross to forgive you and me, but you didn't know that to receive that gift, to put it into practice, it requires repentance. It requires a change, a turning that if, th th from the direction that we've been going to turn toward Christ. Now, He didn't die for us only if we turn. He died for us because it's a gift. A gift we don't receive until we put into practice by humbling ourselves to repent. may be that you, you have repented and you have asked Jesus to, to cleanse all that's past, but you're still hanging on maybe to, to hardship or heartache or maybe you're, you're hanging on to a horror and you've not asked the risen Christ to live in and through you. It's a gift that's been given. It's just that you haven't received it. Well, I want to pray with you this morning. Join with me in prayer. Let's pray. Jesus, this morning, you give us just the word of good news, of gospel that we need. That you've, you've given redemption, you've given forgiveness for us this day. But, Lord, it may be that there's some folks that haven't received it because they haven't turned, haven't repented, humbly haven't turned away from what they've been doing to, to turn towards you. The good news is, is through your resurrection that you rose again to give us power we don't have, power enough to turn, power enough to repent. Not one day, but this day. Lord, this day, may we say yes to you. Put into practice by repentance. Put into practice by asking you to, to make your home with us. To live your life through us. That we might know you, Jesus, the risen Christ, living through us this day. Lord, there also may be those that, this morning, that that, that feeling of love... The feeling's not there. That naturally they feel anything but patient and kind. Naturally they feel anything but, but wanting the best for another. Well, not only do you have the strength to forgive, you have the strength and the power to help us love, to do what's best for the other and not just what's best for us to change what's natural, the impatience, to change the unkindness, to change bitterness, and to love. That's a power we don't have. Lord, give us the, the strength this morning, the strength that we need to change bitterness to love. Lord, it may be that there, there are folks this morning that never knew that you made their home on the inside of them for all who will receive it. And that they've, they've not followed your spirit. They knew it as an idea, but not as spirit to follow, to put into practice put to use and to service, to purpose. 
May this be a day of purpose where your spirit, holy and strong, leads us, not in timidity, but in power, love and discipline, starting right now, this day. We give thanks and praise to you already for what you've done, and we give praise and thanks to you for what you will do. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thanks again for joining us today. Um, just a reminder, if you'd like to watch the entire worship service, you can do so via live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15 a.m. You can also view the service on demand a little bit later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. Also, if you have any prayer requests, we would love to hear about those. You can send those in to pray at rumc.com. Also, if you'd like to give of your tithes and your offerings, you can do that online as well. And that's at rumc.com slash giving. Uh, thanks again for joining us today and for honoring God with your presence. We hope and pray that you have a wonderful week and we look forward to seeing you again next week. Hi, thank you for joining us. My name's Tom Davis. I'm senior pastor here at Roswell United Methodist Church. Our mission here at RUMC is to help people live a Christ-centered life. We're a welcoming church, we're a biblical church, and we're a compassionate church. That the, we believe that the way that, that God made us, that he made us in his image. And what the Bible tells us is that his image is an us, is an our. When God said in the creation story, let us create humans in our image, he made us to be in community together. He made us to connect to him and one another. That's the place that this is at Roswell United Methodist Church, a place of community and faith. I want to invite you to join us. It might be online, it might be through social media, or it might be here in person. We meet at 9 o'clock in a contemporary service with a band. We also have two 1115 services. One is here in the sanctuary with a traditional choir an organ. We also meet at 1115 with a band in our chapel. Thank you for joining us, and I look forward to meeting you.